Hello, everybody. We're going to give a couple minutes uh, before we start. Um, just a quick reminder, we will be recording this uh, workshop and it will be posted online following uh, the conclusion. All right, I think the number of participants joining has stopped picking up. Um, so let's get started. Um, thank you everyone for taking time to attend our grant workshop today. As a reminder, we will be recording this portion or this presentation to post on our website so folks can check it out afterwards. If you have any questions, we will have a Q&A portion after the presentations. Please post your question in the chat box below, and we will get started with a message from Congresswoman Strickland. This is U.S. Representative Marilyn Strickland from the 10th Congressional District of Washington State, and I want to thank you for your interest in federal grant funding opportunities. Our office has already helped secure hundreds of millions of dollars for local organizations doing fantastic work. And part of our responsibility in a, in a district office is to make sure that people understand that there is access to federal grants to help you be more competitive and to get vital resources. Our office is here to support you, to let you know about the grants that are available, to help you navigate the system, to help make sure that your grant application is as strong as possible, and to make sure that we're able to get your money back into the district. Federal grant funding opportunities represent a great way for local communities and local organizations to get access to much needed federal funding, whether it's for human services, social services, and a myriad of opportunities that we have to strengthen our district. So thank you very much for your interest in federal grant opportunities. Our office is here to support you, to help you have a more effective experience, and to make sure that we're able to bring as much funding as possible into the mighty 10th Congressional District of Washington State. Thank you for the work that you do, and we're so thrilled that you're here with us today. Okay, thank you for those remarks, Congresswoman. We will now turn the meeting over to the grants.gov Senior Program Advisor, Judy Caressa, who will present on the federal grants process. So Judy, go ahead. Well, thank you very much for inviting me today um, to talk about the grants.gov system and how you as an applicant can navigate grants.gov to search, uh, find and apply for federal grants, discretionary grant funding. So uh, the topics that I'm gonna discuss today are how to navigate grants.gov, what you need to do to uh, complete a, your registration bef before uh, submitting an application, how to search the grants.gov website, what's actually in a grant funding opportunity, the importance of tracking your application to see it through submission, 
And then at the very end, I'll provide some tips and uh, support resources for you. So if there's anything that you uh, missed that I go through too quickly, uh, you will get a copy of this presentation. And we also have a help desk that's available 24 hours a day, seven days a week for all applicants. And I'll provide that information as well. So Judy, if you got, yes. Sorry, I don't mean to interrupt. Can you share your screen? I don't think we oh, can see your sorry. PowerPoint if you're sharing. Yeah, <laughs> no I, worries. Yeah, this is true. Sorry about that. <laughs> That's fine. I yes. An important feature. <laughs> Just assume that I've done that. Oh my goodness. Okay. Here we go. So I actually right. covered the first two. So let me. Um, sorry about that. Perfect. Judy, you're muted. So if you could unmute yourself so we can hear what you're saying, that would be great as well. Just Perfect. a minor detail. Yeah. Okay. So um, if you're new to grants.gov, this is where you would probably go first. Uh, this is our homepage. So if you typed in www.grants.gov, this is where you would be taken. As I said, we have a lot of different resources on the website. So if you click on the applicant tab, you'll find many, many things. Uh, we have the YouTube videos that are uh, created in two to three minute snippets of any function that you would need to know as an applicant using grants.gov. We have an online user guide and we have uh, frequently asked questions and more. We also have a page on our website called uh, Learn Grants. And folks can learn about different uh, parts of the grants federal the federal grants life cycle by going to that uh, place on our site called Learn Grants. You'll receive a, sort of a 101 on grants. Uh, we talk a little bit about the policies that uh, created grants.gov as well as how uh, grant policies are created, where they come from. Uh, information about certain uh, terms used in the federal grants uh, space. You can also sign up to receive email notifications for grant funding opportunities that um, you find in, in, of interest, uh, as well as plan to apply for. You can receive modifications when those funding opportunities um, are, are modified. Sometimes um, agencies will do so. They'll modify a grant funding opportunity by extending a deadline date or, you know, changing something about the actual opportunity that you'll need to know about. So it's really important that you register and you begin your registration process very, very early. Um, even if you could be months away from uh, getting an application together to uh, create uh, and submit, you want to start this uh, registration process early. And I say that because the um, part of the process is that you will need to go to the System for Award Management or uh, SAM.gov for short. That system is managed by the uh, General Services Administration. And what you will do when you go to that site is you will receive what we call a unique entity identifier or UEI. And if folks are uh, familiar with grants.gov and federal grants, the UEI has taken the place of uh, what was referred to as the DUNS number. So we're no longer using DUNS numbers, we're using UEI numbers. And again, you would get that UEI number from uh, SAM.gov. Now, it can take, I say, approximately 10 to 7 to 10 business days, but I'm going to say for now, they have a little bit of a backup. So I would say give yourself at least a month to uh, receive a complete, to, to actually to have your SAM.gov account 
become active because without having an active account, it's very difficult for you as an applicant to really do anything in the grants, federal grants space. Once your account becomes active, all your data will be electronically transferred uh, to the grants.gov website. That's how we get your information. That's how we get the UEI number, the name of your organization, the person that registered at SAM.gov, which we refer to as the e-business or electronic business point of contact. That's how we know who you are. And at this point, you are ready to, uh, as eBiz POC, assign any roles necessary for your colleagues that work with you in your organization so that they can use grants.gov as well as an applicant and as a participant in the preparation of your application. And if you have questions, please visit the SAM.gov website. This is questions with respect to anything that has to do with SAM.gov. For grants.gov, I'll give you that information at the very end. So if you haven't already done so, you at any time can just create what we call a grants.gov account. Um, you won't be affiliated with an organization unless or until the eBiz point of contact provides you uh, with access to the account or affiliates you or your account. Uh, as an applicant with that organization. So you just fill out, you know, when you're just creating a general account, you're gonna basically fill out the web form, create your username and password and submit it. So there's three roles that you're gonna wanna become familiar with. And all this stuff again is on our website. And if you get any, if you find yourself confused, you don't remember, you can't find what you're looking for on the website, you can reach out to our help desk. So we talked a little bit about the eBiz uh, point of contact or eBiz POC. This person starts the registration process in SAM.gov. When the account becomes active in SAM.gov, again, all that information regarding uh, the organization is transmitted to grants.gov. And it's at this time that the eBiz POC can assign roles to their colleagues. Uh, you, one of the roles and uh, one of the key roles is what we call the authorized organization representative or AOR role. You must have an AOR role in order to submit applications. So if you have, and you, and you also have to have a grant stuck on account. So that's why I say you should just sign up for one at this point. Anyway, even if you're not ready to apply this, you will have, um, you, ha you will have taken the first step to be affiliated with an organization where you work. And then the second primary role is what we call a workspace manager role. So you need both of these roles really. Um, if you want to create what we call a workspace, which I'll go into in a minute, you'll need this role. So it's always a good idea to have both or it just depends on how your organization is set up, but you can decide that um, within your team. So searching for grants is um, pretty straightforward. That the, the interface hasn't changed a lot and we're hoping to give the whole site a, a facelift at some point in the near future. So you can start your search if you choose to by entering in information in the basic search criteria for, for your interests for what you're interested in. You can start by typing in a keyword or a key phrase. Uh, you can start by entering the grant funding opportunity number. That's the number that the agency assigns to an opportunity. Or lastly, the CFDA or system soliciting number. That's just another key identifier. So uh, you can also narrow your search by um, selecting uh, the two, the two uh, opportunity statuses here that are checked by default, the forecast or the posted opportunities, or you can reach down and uh, actually select a search on closed opportunities and archived opportunities. 
So let's go back. So the forecasted opportunity is really what an agency will post in the future for future uh, opportunities that they plan to uh, make available and fund in the near future. And you can find out what the status is of um, all of those uh, opportunities in the uh, opportunity status field. Now, if an agency says uh, has select has posted an opportunity, it'll have the posted um, word below in that column, and that may, mainly means that the opportunity is available, and they are at that time, and they are accepting applications. If the status reads closed, it means that the uh, opportunity has recently closed within the last month, and then archived is past opportunities. And, and they are really available just for reference. And I've used this many times. I know a lot of people have. So the archived opportunities go way back. If you're not finding something that's in, that's forecasted or posted or recently closed, and you're not sure whether there's an agency that provides funding for a particular area that you're interested in, you can always search the archives, which um, can you know provide a lot more information basically anything that's pretty much pretty much ever posted on grants.gov you can also with a grants.gov account you can also um, save your uh, your um, searches too which is a really handy tool to have so then you can also narrow your search by selecting a certain category field like um, you know um, is it a state government or uh, is it a, a you know a, a tribal uh, um, government you know it, it, there's lots of different nonprofit for profit those kinds of things so what's actually in a funding opportunity so if you were to click on a funding opportunity and it was a forecasted opportunity this is basically what it would look like and it's going to provide you uh, an estimate of the post date and due dates for that funding opportunity once it actually is posted. It's also going to give you an estimate of the program's funding amount. So you can decide whether, well, you know, if, they're, if, they're, if they've got, you know, hundreds upon hundreds of millions of dollars, then, and, and also depending on the number of awards they plan to make. You know that that gives you kind of an idea of, of your um, chances of um, uh, getting an award and they also in the forecast give you an estimate of when they plan to make the award so if there is no forecast and in many cases there isn't you'll uh, be taken directly to a synopsis and this is going to give you a lot of the same information that you would find in a forecast only it's opened at that time and available uh, and accepting applications. This is going to give you the same, pretty much the same information as the forecast, like I said. But if you scroll down through the actual synopsis itself, it's also going to provide you with a description of the actual program and contact information for the agency. So if you have a question about what they're actually looking for in they're in a grant from a grant applicant. You can reach out to the program folks that are offering the funding and ask them specifically uh, what your questions are. To the right of the synopsis is what we call the version history tab. And here is where you can click to see whether the agency has made any modifications and to be sure that you are looking at the most current opportunity announcement. To the right of the version history is the related documents tab, and this is where many agencies will post what they call their full uh, funding announcement. And uh, this is where they give you a lot of the details and, and instructions and things that they're looking for in your application. And lastly, to the right of the related documents the agencies will often post an application package, and this allows you the ability to apply directly through grants.gov. By clicking on the package uh, link <clears throat> tab, you can uh, view the forms 
that the agency will be requiring you to fill out as well as instructions uh, for how to do so. So once you submit your application, it's super important to track the application to see it through its submission. So if you if you have just recently uh, clicked on a or clicked the submit button on an application, you'll receive what we call an on-screen confirmation receipt, and in that receipt you'll see what we call the grant stuck of tracking number. It will begin with the uppercase letters grant and then a series of numbers, and you will also receive the official date and time stamp. This is uh, of the actual submission that uh, you have applied for. You, and I say you, I mean the person with the AOR role that's logged in. Mm -hmm. You as the AOR will be the one that receives all these email uh, confirmations. So an application goes through a series of steps uh, to validate that everything is filled out. So the first email that you'll get is your application has been received by grants.gov. And here's your uh, tracking number. You can track track the application to, to through its various uh, stages of validation. And then the second email you'll receive is, was your application validated um, and passed validation or was it rejected? And here's why. Go fix the errors and resubmit. And then lastly, uh, one of the most important things you want to make sure is that the agency for which you have applied for has gone into grants.gov and uh, retrieved the application. So you want to make sure that the agency does end up retrieving your application from grants.gov. So uh, you can track your application in Workspace. And Workspace, just briefly, is a place where you can go to set up your application. Um, it allows you uh, as a team to collaborate together with um, other teammates to prepare all the forms and submit the application. So the reason why I bring this up is that you are looking at a workspace and you want to make sure that if you if you uh, if you're in the process where you've already submitted the application, you want to make sure that you know it's it's uh, the agency has received it, you're following through on the validation, here's a place you could go to check the uh, status of your submission. You can also, after you've submitted, download either in a full PDF or a zip file, the uh, entire application, exactly what the uh, agency is gonna receive when they download your application. Again, you can, you can also track if you're logged in by clicking on the applicant tab and clicking on track my application and entering your grants like tracking number. So we have a mobile app that uh, is available for um, anybody to use. You can go, you can search while you're on the go and you can uh, save or edit or add to queries that you've saved. You can receive notifications of new funding opportunities. You can actually submit an application on a mobile device if you choose to. So a couple of tips, We again, what I said earlier about registering early, you definitely wanna register early and you also wanna submit your application early. Try, try really, really hard not to submit your application on the last day because people run into problems. They've spent a lot of time working on preparing their application and for some reason, there could be some glitch somewhere and they miss the deadline date. So you wanna make sure you register early, give yourself plenty of time to get through the SAM registration process and uh, prepare your application early and submit it before the deadline, usually a couple of days before the deadline date. You obviously wanna thoroughly read and follow all the instructions, fill out the SF-424 forms first, uh, you want, when you uh, provide attachments, because there are places in the forms that you're going to need to upload attachment files, you want to make sure that you're careful when you name those attachment files, limit your character size to 50 characters or less, and only use UTF-8 characters. Try to avoid the special characters. 
obviously use the correct UEI number. And uh, lastly, you want to use PDF the uh, Adobe Reader PDF software. It works best with our forms. Here is the page I was telling you about where you can reach out to the grants.gov help desk. You can call them toll free. You can send them an email at support at grants.gov. We do have somewhat of a social media presence. We have a Twitter account. We have a blog. We send newsletters. If you have a grants.gov account, you can sign up to receive newsletters and access to the blog uh, and also system alerts. And it, I am pretty much finished uh, for my piece of the, uh, the uh, workshop. So I'm gonna stop sharing here and hand it back over to you, Sienna. Perfect, thank you, Judy. That was a great presentation. Um, and as a reminder, we'll have a, a question and answer section towards the end. So please feel free to post your questions in the chat and we'll try our best to get to them. Um, now we welcome US Department of Transportation, mm -hmm. Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary for Governmental Affairs, Kara Fisher. Deputy Assistant Fisher will speak on what makes a promising grant application in addition to the formulas and investments that are part of the bipartisan infrastructure law. So I'm going to hand it over to her. Thanks so much, Sienna, and thank you to uh, Congresswoman Strickland for having me here today. I think it's so important that that you all are here listening, especially hearing from Judy with grants.gov. I think that that information is probably the best thing you can take away from this. So I will try to uh, add to that and supplement. Um, let me start sharing my screen. I'm going to talk a little bit about what makes a good grant uh, application at the Department of Transportation without getting too specific, and then uh, just highlight a couple of the upcoming opportunities that we have uh, that I think Washington State uh, entities will be pretty competitive uh, for. Okay, share, trying to make that full screen. Okay. Um, so uh, at the Department of Transportation, we have a whole host of new programs. So what makes a good grant application? This is more generic advice that could be pretty applicable to any of the programs that we have here. Uh, and the first one I want to highlight is to please read the NOFO, the Notice of Funding Opportunity. Um, this is where the department lays out all of the different criteria that it is looking for in an application. It lays out all of the statutory requirements that projects must meet in order to be considered. It also lays out the different criteria, the additional criteria that will help to make an application more competitive. Um, there are a couple of, you know, key things that are, are listed there. So, for example, if the NOFO says, you know, that your project must include a local match, you need to include a local match in your application and make sure that, that that's demonstrated. Otherwise, it's not going to be eligible under the program. Um, the additional criteria are really where the department lays out the types of things that it, it thinks are very important and they want to focus on. The, the statutory criteria are bare bones, absolute minimum of what must be met. So you definitely wanna make sure you meet that first. Those additional criteria, I think sometimes change from administration to administration, although everyone always has a, has a focus on that. So for example, this administration has a very big focus on climate, equity, job creation. So you'll see in the NOFO, you know, those types of things are highlighted as um, top things to consider when submitting your application. And the advice that I give to everyone is the more of those boxes that you can check, the more competitive your application will be. Um, because we frankly have, even with the increased resources from the bipartisan infrastructure law, the demand for these grants just so far exceeds the available funding. I think we had uh, a thousand different applications for the RAISE program, for example, seeking uh, I think about 15 billion in funds and we still only had 2 billion. So, mm. you know, th these are the types of things that we need to look at to help try and winnow the number of applications down. And unfortunately, because it's such a competitive environment, if you're not reading the NOFO very carefully and making sure you're getting the right things in there, your application is not going to be able to be considered. Um, my second bullet, read other NOFOs. Um, for, for many of our new programs, we don't have NOFOs out yet 
because we're still still working on them. So how can you help prepare so that you don't, you know, some of these NOFOs have rather short application periods. We try to make them as long as we can. Uh, but uh, as Congresswoman Strickland said, we are trying to get the money out the door into your hands. So we want to try and move these grants along as quickly as we can. So for those programs that the NOFO isn't out yet, I would start looking at other NOFOs. Um, if it's an existing program, so for example, like the Chrissy program, where it's been a, a pro, it's been out for many years, you can look at prior year NOFOs to see the types of things. The NOFOs don't change all that much from year to year, um, and especially within the same administration, they're usually going to be pretty similar. So if you if you look at that prior NOFO, that should give you a good idea of the types of things and criteria that they will be looking for. Um, if it's a brand new program. Uh, you can certainly look at other NOFOs to look at some of those consistent administration priorities, climate, equity, job creation. I think that's going to be pretty consistent in the Department of Transportation's uh, solicitations here. Um, but you can also, um, there are a number of DOT resources, and I have some links that I'll go to in a slide or two, um, where you can sign up for webinars, email updates, um, we, we are really making a huge effort to have, you know, webinars and recordings that help communities apply for these programs, particularly the new ones, um, because it's a grant programs only as good as the money that can actually reach the people. So we want to make sure that people that that entities know what is required. So, for example, um, I think we've had a couple of recent webinars about how do you prepare to apply for this reconnecting communities program? The NOFO hadn't, hadn't been out at that point, and this was, you know, a month or two in advance trying to get communities prepared. Um, and I'll, I'll show you a couple of other resources later on. Also sign up for the email updates. I, I work at DOT, and I find those email updates very helpful because it reminds me, first of all, this NOFO just came out. Here is the closing date. It sends me those links to those webinars that I may have missed or other resources that could be helpful in, in applying for these programs. So uh, we certainly have a number of different resources that I would highly recommend you subscribe to. Stakeholder support. Some of this may seem like a little bit of a no brainer, um, but I think get an important consideration for you is to get folks on board with your project. Um, I'm not saying you have to have every possible stakeholder in this area on board or signed on before applying, but it's always helpful to see an application where we've got the mayor, the uh, MPO, the local transit organization, everyone is signed on and supportive of this project, whether or not they're all kind of jointly applying. Um, frankly, just because the more support a project has, the likelier, the, the higher likelihood of success that project is going to have coming to fruition because it's got that support. Um, where it's possible or feasible, I would also certainly recommend some joint applications. Um, one example is in the new mega projects program. Um, you can you can apply for one large project that's you know dedicated to roads or bridges or highways, whatever. But you can also the, the program allows for you to apply on behalf of a kind of program of projects or a series of related projects that can be considered. So this could be, you know, you could have a grade crossing elimination project, a transit station project, a road project kind of bundled into one application. There has to be some kind of connection. You can't just pick and choose the different things that you want in there, um, but you can bundle that into an application and apply for this program on behalf of all of those projects. And obviously I think that would most likely entail having a number of different applicants. Um, so, so that's something that I think really helps to demonstrate the broader community support, the broader, broader emphasis in the community that is always super helpful for being competitive. Uh, congressional support. Uh, again, hopefully this is a no-brainer, but I would strongly recommend that um, you, you chat with your representatives to try and get letters of support for your projects that you're applying for. Um, you know, it certainly won't outweigh a project that doesn't meet the statutory criteria, but knowing that not only does a project have the local support, it also has support from your federally elected representatives that is super helpful for being uh, competitive as well. I do just want to mention really quickly, I know there's a room, I've heard a rumor in some other areas that letters of support have to be submitted with the application. That's not true. 
Um, it's certainly helpful if you submit the letter of, letter of support or multiple letters of support with your application just for tracking purposes, but you do not have to do that. First of all, you don't need any letter of support to submit an application. You can submit it solely on its own, but I will say letters of support help it be more competitive. And then secondly, you can submit letters of support at any time. It does before you file for the project, after you file for the project. Uh, the one caveat I'd say is early is certainly better. Um, getting a letter of support for a raise applicant five days before we announce the raise awards is not is not going to help you. Um, so I would certainly uh, aim to getting letters of support in earlier rather than later. Uh, my final point that I want to highlight, and this is really just emphasizing what Judy mentioned earlier, please, please, please do not wait till the last minute to submit. It is heartbreaking when somebody is emailing us at 4.30 p.m. the day that an application is due saying, I'm having technical issues. I can't log into grants.gov. How can I just send you your application separately? Like, we can't do that. Um, as Judy mentioned, it can take some time to get that process set up. So if you have the person who ran your account retired last year, please, please get, get everything on the IT side and the administration side sorted out well in advance of the, the application submission deadline. And also, please don't wait to submit your application itself at the last minute. We had a number of people this last grant cycle <clears throat> who um, filed at 5 p.m. Pacific time, the deadline was 5 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, and unfortunately, even if you file at 5.01 and the deadline was five o'clock, we can't accept that application. Um, so I just, just want to emphasize what Judy said and take your time. Please be familiar with the system that's going to help you more than anything else. Uh, and don't wait till the last minute. Uh, so I just want to highlight a couple of uh, current grant opportunities uh, that I think uh, you all are probably very familiar with, uh, but these are some that I think are particularly helpful. Um, first, the Bridge Investment Program. Uh, uh, this, is, this is obviously a lot of money dedicated to improving our nation's bridges, including some of the you know, most economically significant bridges. Applications... Um, over here, I have three dates that are due because there are actually three dates for this NOFO. The first was for planning projects. That was uh, July 25th. The second is for large projects over $100 million. That was uh, August 9th. And then September 8th is the deadline for smaller projects under $100 million. Uh, and I will highlight that I think up to 5% of these funds can be used to replace culvert which I know is a particular interest for Washington State. Uh, the Natural Gas Distribution Infrastructure Safety and Modernization Program. This was a program um, that provided a billion dollars for community-owned pipelines to replace uh, aging and unsafe pipeline. Uh, applications were due, I think, the 8th of August. The ferry programs. Um, we have this, we've done a combined NOFO for the low, low, oh, I'm going to get the names wrong. I'm so sorry. I think it's the electric and low or no, uh, low emitting or no emitting uh, ferry programs, rural ferry programs and re regular ferry programs. Oh boy, that's a mouthful. Um, <coughs> instead of having three separate NOFOs that you have to look at, there's one combined NOFO um, for all of those different programs. Uh, the applications are due September 6th. The Safe Streets and Roads for All program is a new program that uh, I think will be a particular interest to our, our more local entities because a lot of the highway safety money goes through the state DOT. It filters down from the state to the local. The Safe Streets and Roads for All program is uh, solely dedicated to giving funding to local entities. Um, there is a, a billion dollars this year to help improve roadway safety, and it's actually a pretty broad um, swath of projects that qualify, and this is specifically targeted to uh, more local and regional entities who really know best how to, how to spend that money. Um, those applications are due September 15th. The All Stations Accessibility Program. 
this is to help improve accessibility at transit stations across the country. Applications due the end of September. Uh, another program that I think Washington State could certainly benefit signif significantly from is the Railroad Crossing Elimination Program. This is a new program in addition to the CRISI program where you can also apply uh, for rail focused projects. And in addition to programs like the RAISE program where you can apply for anything, this is a program dedicated specifically to eliminating grade crossings where the highway meets the railroad. Um, so uh, their uh, applications for that program are due October 4th. Um, and then the Reconnecting Communities Pilot Program applications are due the 13th. This is to help communities that may have been separate, you know, some piece of transportation infrastructure may have divided a community, may have unintentionally caused some kind of hardship where it is really difficult for one side of the community to access the other. And this program is intended to help bridge that gap. Applications are due the 13th. And want to highlight just a couple more upcoming grant opportunities you should see soon. Culvert Replacement and Restoration. This is a brand new program uh, with, oh, I'm going to, let's see, $200 million, five years, $200 million uh, it, this year alone to uh, replace and restore culverts. We're expecting that NOFO to come out late summer. The fiscal year 22 Chrissy program, we're expecting that NOFO to come out in August. Strengthening Mobility and Revolutionizing Transportation Grant Program, the SMART Grant Program. Uh, that NOFO is expected in September. Um, and that is also going to be a, a pretty broad NOFO, really about um, enhancing mobility, use of technology in uh, transportation. Federal State Partnership for Inner City Rail. Uh, this is a program that's going to help uh, support inner city rail expansion and maintenance. That NOFO is expected in October. Promoting resilient operations for transformative, efficient, and cost-saving transportation program. That is a mouthful, the PROTECT program. Um, we actually, this, this program has both a formula component and a discretionary component. Um, the department just issued guidance on the formula side and the discretionary side of that program, the NOFO is expected in late 2022. And then finally, uh, the airport terminal program. We just announced a round of awards um, not that long ago, but we are gearing up for another round of awards in very short order. So we're expecting the NOVO for that in early 2023. Um, this is just a list of some of the new discretionary and formula programs. I talked about a couple of these already. Really, I just wanted to showcase the fancy little icons I had that noted each different program. Um, but this is these are some of the amounts that the bipartisan infrastructure law made available over five years um, for these programs, which is hugely significant. We've got you know thirty eight billion dollars for bridges alone. Uh, the National Electric Vehicle Formula Program, five billion dollars, two point five billion for charging and fueling infrastructure. Um, those protect formula and discretionary grants I mentioned at 8.7 billion. Uh, reduction of truck emissions at port facilities, 400 million. Uh, the new mega projects program, 5 billion. Railroad crossing elimination program, 5 billion. Uh, culverts, 1 billion. Uh, just a, a note, uh, these numbers that I have here are in uh, actual appropriations amounts that we have. The, some of those programs, the ones that have that number in parentheses are authorized for additional funding. So it's possible through the regular appropriations process, we might get more money, but at the very least, we've got that first column of, of money is guaranteed over the next couple of years. Uh, so I promised at least a, a couple of resources. This first one is uh, transportation.gov, which is DOT's website. The bipartisan infrastructure law, I just, this isn't what the website looks like totally. I just took a screenshot of something I think is super, whoops, let me go back super helpful um, and it has, first you can click on funding opportunities, which gives you a list of upcoming NOFOs. You can also just Google DOT upcoming NOFOs and it will take you to that website because that's what I do every time I need to find that list. Um, this grant list uh, button in the middle has a list of literally every single DOT grant program and the total amount of funding that was provided for. 
Uh, I find this one very helpful for just seeing all the many different opportunities. And then there's also an additional resources tab. Um, the second link I wanted to share was transportation.gov slash DOT Navigator. This is a, a newer endeavor on our part to really help entities become familiar with all of these different programs. So this is just a quick screenshot of three things that I think are helpful. Here is apply for DOT grants on the left side. How do you help them understand the process? This middle one, find technical assistance resources. This has specific links for if you are an MPO, if you're a local, if you're a state, what are the best resources that we can provide for you? And then again, the last, um, learn more information about the, the uh, infrastructure law and funding opportunities. This is just the, the two top links that I just showed you. And the last one is build.gov, which is the White House's um, uh, a website for this. So I will stop sharing. I'm pretty sure I went way over my allotted time. So I apologize and I will turn it back over to Sieta. No, we are, we're running on time just about, which is great. So thank you for that presentation. That was really informative. We're now going to roll into the Q&A section of our presentation. Um, questions have been taken from the chat um, and I will be asking them and then the relevant uh, guest speaker can hopefully give us an answer and we'll try to get as many as we can. Um, so the first question, this looks like it might be a question for Judy. Um, getting a UEI has been very difficult. Currently we have, we are about to distribute relief funds, um, but many haven't been able to get their number. Any advice on how we might help these folks? So if you're an applicant and you're trying to get a UEI and if you're a current applicant or if you're trying to apply for funding and you can't get a UEI, you want to call their help desk. It's called the FSD, the Federal Service Desk at GSA, uh, and get a ticket. Um, if you're a current applicant, you can escalate to the agency that gave you the grant and they can escalate that to to the folks at GSA that are working with that backlog. There's a current backlog getting uh, UEIs. Uh, this occurred, I believe, it, well, it started shortly after um, the beginning of April when we migrated to uh, using the UEI number that is generated by uh, SAM.gov. So um, I would just you know, call the help desk, get ticket numbers, and, and make sure you keep those ticket numbers escalate 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 that's all i can say and we're all suffering from that right now on both the um applicant side as well as the grantor agency side you know we do feel a bit hostage to the entire situation i do know that there are you know there there are talks happening behind the scenes to somehow uh help this process move along quicker but it's uh uh, I, you know, I'm sorry, it, it's a difficult time right now. Okay, thank you for that answer. Um, our next question, how can grant applicants reach out to grantors with any issues with an opportunity? They should reach out. Uh, if, they, if, they, if they're trying to find information on grants.gov about an opportunity, there should be contact information within the opportunity that will tell you who to reach out to. Sometimes it's just an email. Sometimes it's a name and an email address and a phone number. It just depends on the agency, how big they are, how well staffed they are, how many grants they provide. Um, but I would I would try and find somebody within that agency that can help you. And um, yeah, I mean, that's that's what I would share. And again, escalate, you know, if you're looking for funding it, I'm just going to throw it out there, HUD. And um, no, you, you don't, you can't get information on, you know, what it is you need to complete your application. Escalate it. Okay, sounds good. Um, okay, next question. Is there any flexibility on matching funds for grant opportunities, smaller organizations can find matching fund requirements inequitable. So I know this is a, a consistent question that we get, 
And unfortunately, most of the um, local versus federal match requirements are set forth in statute by Congress. So we don't usually have a lot of flexibility with that, uh, but I would certainly look at the particular programs. I know for some of the newer programs that were created last year, for example, there uh, is some language for at least one, if not more of the programs that says your local match can, you know, you can use these types of funds, uh, RIF or a TIFI loan for your local match. Um, you know, there may be some flexibility built into the statute. Um, and I know this is especially hard right now, given, given where everyone's at financially. But uh, for the most part, this is, this is a, a, an issue that we don't have a whole lot of control over as much as we might want to try and provide that flexibility, but would certainly recommend reaching out to uh, your, your elected representative's office on that. Perfect. Thank you for answering that question. Um, the next question is, how long does a typical grant application take to process? Uh, so I will say part of that depends on how many applications there are, if it's a newer novel program um, and and hiring. Um, I'll give I'll give an example. I mentioned the raise program. We had over a thousand applications. Um, and so we are just getting ready to announce those per the awards later this week. Um, and I believe the NOFA for that closed in May, if I recall correctly. So, it, it takes a couple of months for that amount of applications to be processed. If it's a smaller grant program with a smaller amount of funding, it should hopefully take a little less time. Um, but for example, like the, the mega projects program that uh, the NOFO is already closed on, it's going to take a couple more months to get through those uh, just because A, the projects are super complex by the very nature of the program. And B, we've also got a significant number of applications to get through. Um, and so it's just, it it can, I know this is a terrible answer that's not super helpful, but it depends. Okay, sounds good. That makes sense. Um, okay, uh, the next question is, are there any ways to obtain um, grant application extensions for extenuating circumstances? So our NOFOs, the ones that go through grants.gov, we do have a, there should be a portion in every NOFO that explains what to do if there are extenuating circumstances. Um, uh, I will say, you know, that the NOFO will lay out what those circumstances are. It is very hard to meet that. And, you know, having IT issues is not going to be an extenuating circumstance. Um, it's a very high bar to meet, but I would look at the NOFO to see what those are, and I would certainly just document, document, document everything that happened um, that led up to that, that circumstance so that you've got that documentation ready to make your case. Okay, sounds good. This is also a reminder to our folks who are our panel, or not our panelists, our attendees, um, to submit any more questions because we're moving through them quite fast. Um, so yeah, if you have more questions, put them in the chat and we can ask our speakers. Uh, this next question asks, um, can you see how many applicants have applied for a grant opportunity? Um, uh, Judy maybe might have an answer for that one. I'm not sure. I know at DOT, we don't publicize that information until after the award round. Um, but I don't, I don't know if there's an opportunity to do that with grants.gov. So I'm sorry. The question was how can you, can applicants find out how many applications have been submitted for an opportunity? Yeah. Are you able to see how many applicants have applied for a grant opportunity? Well, the, the agencies can, if they, you know, if they use grants.gov, they can log in, but, right. um, I don't believe that information is, is provided publicly. I mean, I think that information goes out after awards have been made. And one of the places that you can look, uh, to see the, um, the spread of applications and where, they're mostly funded and by who is on usaspending.gov. That's one place where uh, agencies are required to report uh, how they've spent the money, where they've spent the money. And I, I believe 
I don't know for sure, but they could they could tell you specifically what programs were um, uh, um, uh, funded. Okay. Cool. All righty. I'm not seeing any additional questions, so we can start to ask our last question and kind of wrap things up. Um, the next question is asking for contact information for speakers in their offices, um, which I think I can answer and that I will follow up with both Judy and um, the De Deputy Assistant Fisher and grab um, PowerPoints where applicable and, and information and emails. And so folks who are attending the webinar can expect some form of information um, from our office. We also plan to post the recording of this webinar online. So once that up, we can let folks know um, where they can find more information. Um, and you can always call our office or send us an email if you have questions um, for the member um, that we can assist with. Um, and then, yeah, I think that we can start to wrap things up. I wanna thank everyone for your questions and for joining the workshop today. Um, if you did not get your question answered or you have additional things that come up, you can contact Congresswoman Strickland's office at 360-459-8514 and we can help you out. You can also visit um, our website. I would also recommend that if folks are interested in the federal grants process to um, sign up for our um, newsletter. Um, every month our newsletter goes out to folks who are signed up to receive it. And it includes um, some funding opportunities that we've picked that we think that folks in Washington's 10th would be interested in. So yeah, and that concludes our webinar. Um, yeah, thank you so much for joining um, and thank you to our speakers. And I hope everyone has a good rest of their day. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, Sienna, do you mind staying on really quickly? Yeah. Oh, yeah.